brought my fan base with me. You could hear them just now. I'm just going to take a sip of water. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Matt. It is indeed a pleasure to be here again and uh, a pleasure to talk about dual diagnosis as well. Um, I've been introduced, so I don't have to explain much. Today I'll be looking at dual diagnosis quite broadly, go into treatment models and look at what we can do and also focus a little bit on personalized medicine. What I actually want to do is shed some light on how can we make, how can we find the person behind the illness and still get to personalize your treatments, even though we all have big treatment centers and modalities and things. So how do we get to the core of what's going on uh, in order to personalize um, our treatments? Unfortunately, I still have nothing to disclose, but uh, I keep on showing that slide. Uh, so that for those of you who need a bit of structure and uh, where's a bit of control issues, <laughs> like myself, uh, just oh, I was told not to go to go close to the speaker. Uh, an outline, like I said, I'll, I'll start off with looking back, a short, looking at a short history of addiction care and kind of uh, where we are at now. Then I will continue to look at dual disorders broadly, like I've just said, and end up with personalized addiction care um, with, and end up with a few examples of how to achieve this in your own practice. So um, there's quite a lot, a lot of slides. I'm going to try to end all my slides in about an hour and then we have enough time for discussion because I also want to hear your experiences and uh, maybe we could share some knowledge about this. <coughs> so. These are a few key dates for me. Um, if we look at the development of addiction care throughout the years, um, there's been a few strange things. We, come, we really come from a strange place. I mean, we come from Freud suggesting cocaine to cure alcoholism. I mean, I know people who would have loved that. Um, sterilization laws for people with uh, addiction. We really came, f we were coming from a very strange place. And then really in 1935, it all started when the AA was formed by Bill W. and Dr. Bob, which I'm not going to go into. And what you can see on this timeline is it's all about therapeutic models and how to manage it. So we've been busy with trying to find a way in treating addiction, but it's all very focused on um, the addiction side of it and not as much on the rest. Later on, a uh, big discovery was Jelinek in the, US, in the States started to call it a disease, this, uh, the disease concept of addiction. And a lot of what Jelinek did, we don't use anymore, but it was kind of the first step towards uh, a medicalized model. What I don't like about the disease concept is it is about the illness. And I think we should, the next step we should take um, is to have it about, to, to talk about the solutions and the resilience and the strength. And that's where we are now. So. If you're still a, a disciple of Jelinek, then uh, keep on listening. Um, another big one was in 1978 when Wise and the colleagues discovered the dopamine hypothesis of reward and linking that to addiction. So here we start seeing a different side to addiction. We start seeing chemical explanations. Um, and as we all know, like the, dopamine, uh, the role of dopamine in addiction is quite well known. But the role of dopamine is also quite well known for other illnesses like schizophrenia, for example. So then it started to become really interesting for psychiatrists as well to look into addiction care. And like you see, uh, Narcan, Naltrexone, uh, we saw the rise of medications um, used in the treatment of addiction. But we never, we, and we're still not there, we don't have a pill to treat addiction. I stopped collecting dates of what happened where and when, uh, when I got to the last 20 years of addiction cares, because so much actually happened. Um, I mean, the role of dopamine in the nucleus accumbens was confirmed. Uh, neuroimaging techniques, Nora Volkov did wonderful work in looking at the pathways of addiction. Um, we have a uh, frontostriatal system was uh, discovered, uh, the executive cognitive control system. Meanwhile, while the, this is all happening, the therapists are actually working the hardest in addiction care by doing things about CBT, motivational interviewing, and combined interventions for addiction. And what we were talking about today, amongst other things, is integrated dual disorder treatment, which is another treatment modality therapy framework, if you want. 
So I think we need to realize where we come from in order to look to the future. And I think we should be proud. We should be proud of ourselves, but also of the, the scientists for getting us this far. And I think we shouldn't stop. I think we're only at the beginning of really discovering what will work and what won't work. So looking at definitions, um, the American Society of Addiction Medicine uh, made a very nice uh, uh, attempt at a, uh, a definition of addiction and they define it as a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory and related circuitry. I can read it here as well, this may be easier. Um, and the dysfunction in these circuits lead to characteristic biological, psychological, social and spiritual manifestations. This is reflected in an individual pathologically pursuing reward and or relief by substance use and other behaviors. And the reason why I included this slide is when reading this, you can also read many other mental illnesses. You could have used this for depression. Chronic depression is also a primary chronic disease well, of serotonin, amongst other things. Um, and this is a great starting point to look at addiction. If you haven't been on the website of ASAM, please go and look, they have a short uh, and a long uh, definition, and it really covers the gist of it. The second part of the short definition, I won't bother you with a long definition, is this, and I want to focus on the last sentence. So without treatment or engagement in recovery activities, addiction is, a is, a progressive, is progressive and can result in disability and premature death. And I think we really need to realize that we are working with a lethal uh, disorder. People die from addiction. That brings me to the definition of dual disorders and dual diagnosis, whatever you want to call it. And the de definition I found was a mental illness and a substance abuse problem occurring in the same person. And I really don't like this definition. And there are two reasons why I don't like it. The first one is they point out that there's a mental illness and substance abuse as if it's completely different things and the mental illness is the main problem. And they also only talk about substance abuse, they don't talk about other addictions. So I think something needs to be done about the diagnosis we follow. Much better, I think, is comorbidity, to talk about the comorbidities occurring in the same person. Or even the co-occurrence, even though co-occurrence uh, doesn't exactly point to the gravity of the disease of addiction kind of underscores, I, I think my, my personal idea would be to talk about comorbidity and say the one is addiction, because it is really a thing, plus another mental illness. And in that, we should not forget the biopsychosocial and spiritual consequences or causes of this. So if there's anybody from the dual dis diagnosis workshop here, this would be my suggestion. Looking at the numbers, I want to go a little bit into epidemiology, but I don't want to bore you to death with numbers, so I'm going to stick to three slides. And to make it a little bit more bearable, I brought in a case that I really treated, and I call her Mrs. X. This is uh, with informed consent of this, she knows that I'm, I'm doing this. And uh, we will be discussing her today during the, the course of the lecture to kind of explain a few things. So Mrs. X is a 29-year-old Asian female university student brilliant, brilliant architecture student. She lives in The Hague, and she presented with suicidal thoughts. And I was called in by the intake team and said, we have to look at her because she's suicidal. And she was suicidal in a way that she said she was only gonna live till 36, because she didn't want the life that she had by that time. And what did she have? She had depression, well, labile mood, not sleeping well, not concentrating. She had panic attacks, especially with exams to the point where she couldn't actually write any exams. So she was struggling in school. And to get the nerves under control and the concentration, she learned that she could balance it with alcohol and coffee. So she would get up in the morning, eat spoons of coffee because the cup didn't do it, then go to school. She even moved closer to the university in order to, to balance things. Then she'd go to one lecture, started to buzz from the coffee, go back home, drank a few glasses of wine, go to the, well, she missed the second lecture, go to the third one. After lunch, went back, and the whole day went, went on like this. In the end, in the evening, she was dead tired. She missed one day, and then she got back to school. So, understandably, she didn't want to live like this. 
And of course, she found Google and she diagnosed herself with borderline personality disorder, panic disorder and depression. And in her own words, she was the craziest person she knew. So let's see if she was right. So in the Netherlands, we did a, a big population-based study, the Nemesis trial. Um, and out of the Nemesis trial uh, comes these number, numbers. Uh, the lifetime prevalence of any mental illness. So you, the lifetime, your, your chances of getting any mental illness in the Netherlands is 42.7%. Lifetime prevalence of substance-related disorders is around 20%. Yeah, that's a lot. It's a fifth of people will struggle with addiction at some, and this is only substance abuse. This is not the behavioral addictions. Um, the lifetime prevalence of mood disorders is 20%, about the same for anxiety. Uh, ADHD is about 9.2, which is higher than other countries. I think we might be overdiagnosing a little bit. The lifetime prevalence of substance use disorder in mental illness is 40 to 60%. So if you treat mental illness, if you're a psychiatrist or psychologist working with severe mental illness, probably 40 to 60 percent of your patients will have um, addiction. If you work in an addiction unit, probably 60 to 80 percent of your patients will have something else. So very high numbers. What do you have to think about? So these are the numbers that came out of that study. Schizophrenia, about 50%, bipolar, depression, ADHD, anxiety, PTSD, and personality disorders. Um, although these numbers are quite, I would not uh, look at those 44% of personality disorders too much, because it's difficult to diagnose them yeah. in substance use. Uh, but the rest, uh, I think, is quite accurate, but also quite high numbers. So these are numbers on substance use disorders. What about the behavioral addictions? I just chose one, I went through all of them. If you look at pathological gaming disorder, the lifetime prevalence of having any other psychiatric disorder with pathological gambling is 97%. Chances that you have alcohol use disorder, 75%, drugs, 40 Personality disorders, more than 60%. Mood, around 50 and anxiety, more than 40%. So just looking at these numbers, you will see how, how serious the problem actually is. And most of us don't even diagnose uh, pathological gambling disorder or internet disorders or whatever is not in the DSM. So let's look at Mrs. X further. So in her childhood, she already discovered that she had feelings of depression, insecurity. She had, was poorly attached to the parents. Uh, her father was very, very strict, punitive father. Her mother was not really emotionally available. And later on in life, she had feelings of, well, insecurity, poor self-esteem. Uh, she struggled to complete tasks. Uh, she was always late. She was only uh, performing under pressure and more than the rest of us. Um, and she failed in school. She was in her eighth year of four-year study architecture. So. What's important in dual diagnosis is to look at the why. I don't know if you all know this. Um, it's from Simon Sinek, it's actually from business, business models, to say you must always start with the why. So I like to start with the why. And if you think of why people get addicted, there's a good starting point. So the first one is experimental. I mean, we all know the person that in his teenage years went to a party and used some speed, smoked outside, tried alcohol, maybe got drug addicted. We all know this person. Some people become addicted from it, some not. The second option is to feel good. I have a friend that uh, is smoking weed and he says, Constant, I'm a good guy. I'm a husband, I have a child, I'm a teacher. I go to school every day, I teach, I'm nice to everybody, I deal with the children, even worse, I deal with the parents, and I'm nice. And the only thing I want to do is on a Friday afternoon, I want to go home and smoke weed. Am I addicted? <laughs> to feel good. Now we're getting closer. To feel better, that's getting onto the point of dual disorders. Mm. People who feel bad want to feel better. 
And one way to do it is to use drugs, alcohol, get addicted. And the fourth option is to do better. So if you think of Mrs. X, she needed to do better at school, and the only way she could was with the coffee, alcohol, coffee, alcohol situation. So actually, if you want to think about why people get addicted in the first place, it's quite easy it's to it's exper experimental, to feel good, to feel better, or to do better. That brings us to the question, chicken or egg? And this is a tough one. How do we get to the bottom of this? So I have a few options for you. The first one is a primary mental illness <coughs> leading to an addiction. Good example is somebody with an anxiety disorder um, learning that uh, alcohol can calm the nerves and becoming alcohol addicted, for example. Second option, oh, my bullets are wrong. Second option is self-medicating the side effects of the stuff we prescribe for them. So, if you think of schizophrenia, we prescribe antipsychotics, good drugs against the voices, horrible drugs for side effects. People get stiff, they can't move, they have no facial expression, they can't connect to people. And what's ma what makes it better? Smoking cigarettes. That's why if you work in mental health, so many schizophrenic patients smoke. Another option is a mental illness can actually trigger, trigger or worsen an addiction. So think of your um, panic attack patient uh, drinking alcohol. The next step is patient become impulsive due to the alcohol and this might lead to drug addiction. So then it's like a bit of a few steps to the, to the cause of it. But mainly the first two is what we see. The last one is the prescribing med of medicine so this is caused by the doctors that might trigger an addiction. And I said rarer, and the reason is because of the uh, uh, myth that if you prescribe medicine for ADHD, people will become addicted on the medicine. That is a rare occasion. But this is not rare. If you look at what's happening in America now, uh, it's huge. We don't have to, I don't even have to tell you guys. I think uh, I've heard it in so many different lectures of how bad this is. So caused by the doctors themselves. Other way around, primary addiction with a psychiatric sequelae, how does that work? So there is no real foundation in literature that a substance can cause a mental illness in that way. There is literature that it can unveil an underlying uh, uh, <coughs> mental disorder. So let's say you are prone to becoming depressed, alcohol might trigger that. If you are prone to psychosis, cannabis can trigger that. That is proven. Third option is you have two things in one patient and it's got nothing to do with each other. It's, it's possible. You see that sometimes. Or common etiology. And what I mean with that is like if you think of conduct disorder and addiction, they both have family problems and family dysfunctions as a cause. Another option is shared genetic risk. For example, we know in ADHD and addiction, they share genetics. So these are really your four options you have. So how do you make sense of it? This is a very, very, very simple example of a timeline. And so piece, putting all the pieces of the puzzle together, important to do a timeline. Without a timeline, you're completely lost. You can try, but you will be lost. So in Mrs. X, we started in infancy, and I really do this with my patients, and sometimes it's infancy, childhood, adolescence, sometimes it's really the ages that it happened, sometimes it's a bigger thing. In her, we did it like this. So it started in infancy with the attachment issues. That stayed until, well, when I saw her. In childhood, it was the start of the ADHD symptoms and the depression. That was also still uh, there when I saw her. And later on, in early adulthood, she started to become addicted. And actually the last thing as a result of the addiction was the anxiety and panic attacks. And here you can see how one thing led to another. So this is one way of getting the big picture. So what happens if we don't treat these people with dual disorders? Is it serious? Is it okay not to do it? I think the answer is quite obvious. We have to stop that red ball. If we don't, untreated dual diagnosis has a bad effect on the treatment. 
And if you have addiction in mental illness, or if you have mental illness in addiction, it doesn't really matter. The influence is other badly. The outcomes are worse. We have higher rates of non-response or poor response to regular treatment, more frequently non-compliant. We have increased hospital rates and admissions, increased suicidality, and increase in overall health costs. If you look a little bit further, it also has a negative effect on psychosocial functioning. There's a higher rate of homelessness, higher rates of unemployment, family problems, legal problems, medical problems, higher rates of HIV, hepatitis and uh, sexually transmitted diseases, and a higher mortality rate. We spoke about the mortality. So I wanted to just focus a little bit on this. People with dual diagnosis have poorer access to healthcare facilities. And the reason is, the stigma, the first reason is the stigma in the healthcare sector. I'm not sure how many people here have heard this, where you have somebody who's a psychiatrist working in a psychi psychiatric unit, and they talk about the patient, yeah, but that one is addicted, you know, that will never be getting better. You know, as, as long as the patient is addicted, nothing will happen with the, the, the mood. Other way, way around, in an addiction unit, yeah, but that patient has ADHD. I mean, we can try and treat, but you know, it's a problem. We stigmatize patients ourselves. There are less qualified staff treating these disorders, and they, are more, they have more problems getting care and treatment, and there's a general low availability of dual disorder treatment facilities. So what do we do with assessment? Um, let me just go one back. Um, I'm not going to go into the whole assessment thing, but I'm going to talk about the bare minimum because I know everybody has their own way of assessing patients. The first one I want to focus on is a biographical assessment, and I'm talking about a lifespan and a genogram. I think if you don't start way at the, right at the beginning, you will get, get lost as well, and you will miss things. So really start at the beginning, do a whole lifespan, and do a genogram. We'll get back to genograms uh, at the end. Do a complete addiction history. Um, Alistair Mordi that's speaking tomorrow gives a wonderful talk and I hope it's in his book as well. I don't know if Ali is here. But he gives a wonderful talk about addiction and he's got a whole table in which they actually tick off which addictions the patient has. And we are all embarrassed to ask the 70 year old grandfather who's alcohol addicted if he also is addicted to gambling and watching porn and those kind of things. But we have to ask. We have to screen for everything because you do get cross addiction and if you don't do it you will miss the cross addiction. So take a complete addiction history. Obviously do a complete medical and psychiatric history and ask for the symptoms, ask for the common things that occur commonly. Don't forget the trauma history and I'm talking about physical, emotional but also about the adverse childhood events, the ACE things, very, very important. It doesn't have to be a life-threatening trauma as we think of in post-traumatic stress disorder. A small trauma, being bullied in school, we have to ask patients. Patients are also hesitant in to, to talk about that. Functioning, this is actually why we do treatment. We treat in order to make people function better. So if you don't ask about the functioning, you don't know what your starting point is. Quality of life, very, very important. Big one, assess safety. If you do a first assessment, then maybe the most important thing you can do in your first assessment is to assess safety. And this has to do with uh, human rights and with ethics, whether you can treat a patient against the will when you need to do something now or whether you can, you can wait. Screening tools are not diagnostic tools. Oftentimes I hear people say that they like to just do a screening for this and a screening for that, and if the screening is positive, then a person has the diagnosis. It doesn't work that way. Screening tools point us toward diagnosis, but they do not make, you can't make a diagnosis with a screening tool. So first get the big picture. Like I said, with the timeline is one way. I'll show you two other ways how you can get the big picture, and then advise a treatment strategy. <coughs> so getting the big picture one way uh, in which some people like to do it, is to do a biopsychosocial approach. 
So I filled in a lot of things I could think of here. And in purple, I don't know if the color is good at the, at the back. Yeah. I can see it in the mirror. The purple stuff is what we found with Mrs. X. So she had a genetic load, um, the personality structure, self-esteem. She had adverse childhood events. There were ACE stuff there. Um, there were many transitions in the family, which we got to once we did the genogram, which I'll show you a little bit later on as well. And the culture, the fact that she was from a different culture. I work in the Netherlands and she was from Chinese origin. She lived in a Chinese family and they had very little uh, bond with Dutch culture. She also did not see herself as, as uh, being Dutch. Another way to get the big picture, I'm going to stand here a little bit because I'm very warm. I think nobody can see. I can't stand here again. Uh, getting the big picture, if I faint, somebody help me, please. I might turn this a little bit. Is it okay if I turn this a little bit? <sighs> Fabulous, then I won't die. Okay, getting the big picture. You can start with the problems or the diagnoses if you want. I prefer problems, diagnoses, you sometimes have to do for the health insurance, they might help. But go for the problems that the patient presents with. This is a way of the first way already that you can do personalized medicine with your patient. What are your problems? List them. This is the easy one to do. Then what I do is I look at the predisposing factors. So what made you vulnerable in the first place? Was it a genetic risk? Was it childhood events? What made you vulnerable to become addicted or depressed or whatever you have? Third one is the third P, by the way. These are called the five P's of psychodynamic formulation. Is the precipitating factor. So what triggered this event? Why are you sitting across from the table from me now? List those with the patient. Then we get to the difficult stuff. Perpetuating factors. What makes it that you keep on coming back, that you keep on relapsing? What prevents you from staying in remission, staying in recovery? List that. And last is my favorite, protective factors. What are your resilience factors, if you will? What do you have going for you? What makes you strong? And what I find is often at the beginning of therapy, people don't know any. They sit and they can't think of a single thing that makes them strong. And they say, well, you know, you're from a family and you're sitting here and you, and you have humor and I, we laughed about a few things as well. That's already making you a little bit strong. And they're quite shocked to hear that I can say that they are strong because they're sitting there and they're addicted and depressed and it's horrible. But later on in therapy. So this is something that you can use and keep updating it as you go along in your therapy. Um, it's very nice to also see your patient grow and the first three things kind of disappearing or decreasing and the resilience starting to grow. And that's why I say I don't really like the disease model of addiction. We should rather go for a resilience model, I guess, uh, for addiction. So this is the second way of getting a big picture. So once again, assessment, I'm not going to do a whole thing about diagnosis. The first question is, does it matter? Do we need to diagnose? Does anybody care? And the answer is yes and no. Sometimes it helps. Some patients really appreciate the fact that, oh, I have ADHD, like Ms. X really, really appreciated it. Like, oh, so I have addiction and I have ADHD, and for the rest, there's actually nothing wrong with me. <laughs> she really appreciated it. We are, I know there was a little bit more, but she appreciated it. It could also work against you or against the patient that it uh, causes stigma again. I mean, especially if the diagnosis is not right. I see a lot of patients in my practice that come in with a diagnosis borderline personality disorder. It seems to be a kind of a fashionable thing, diagnosis to give. And half the time, by the time they leave, it's not true. It was never true. They never had borderline personality disorder. Only diagnosed, diagnosed if you are trained to do so. Uh, once again, that goes well with uh, not using questionnaires to diagnose um, and be careful with what you share with the patient in your provisional diagnosis. I think we all have, everybody that has assess assessments, as you go through your assessment, you start building a differential diagnosis and it's quite dangerous to share these um, because half the time you're wrong halfway through and you only know the real diagnosis in the end of the diagnostic process. So don't share things if you don't know. Um, we've done that. Um, use the DSM or the ICD. I mean, it is useful. It is there also there for research? It's important to do research. 
I'm much more a fan of a psychodynamic diagnosis to talk about problems and predisposing the five P's. I think that's much more useful. So if you have to do the DSM-4 or 5 because the health insurer wants you to do that, go for it. But also do the psychodynamic diagnosis and capture the big picture. It's great if you can have a formulation on one page that you can share with your patient and also have in your file to kind of work from. So the implications of all of this is this. If you have a patient, if, if you say these are four, three patients, A, B, and C, patient A has severe mental illness, at the bottom there's mental illness, severe mental illness, but the addiction is mild. Because you know in the DSM-5 you have mild, moderate, severe of everything. So this is a different patient than patient B, who has severe addiction and mild mental illness, or maybe even no mental illness. And that one is different to patient C. And the point I want to make with this slide is that one shoe can never fit all when you treat addiction. There's not one model that works for all these patients. That doesn't exist. So kind of have an idea on your, with your patient of where they are at on this diagram. You can make it even more complicated for yourself if you like that. You can make a 3D model like I did. And you put those two, addiction and psychiatry, at the bottom and you look at functional impairment and then you have a little floating ball. And then you can imagine how, I mean, I didn't know how to do it in 4D, but I guess you can make it even more complicated. So how do we treat? There are different treatment models. When I was a student in psychiatry, we were taught this, sequential treatment. You start by treating the substance use disorder, then you go for the mood, then the anxiety. ADHD, okay, that came later for adults. And you might end up treating smoking. The problem with this is, in treatment with adults, we usually stop at anxiety disorder. We never get to the ADHD if we do this. And while you're treating the anxiety disorder, the ADHD will cause the patient to relapse. So this just causes problems. Far better is IDDT, Integrated Deal Disorder Treatment. And this is a, an example of what it might look like. So you start with the detox, you treat the addiction. While you're doing this, you're treating the ADHD, anxiety disorder, whatever you find. And the question here is, what first? Because there's still a little bit of sequentiality within this dual treatment. The answer is the crocodile closest to the boat. So whatever needs the most attention, what's the most pressing, you go for that first. So IDDT, um, the point of IDDT is it's one team treating in one location at the same time. And that's difficult, so that's tough. It does work well, it works better than parallel treatment. So parallel treatment looks exact, exactly the same as this, except that it's, it might be two teams treating the same location or one team treating in different locations. The second based also works well, as long as you do as much as you can together and immediately for the patient. What do you need for an IDDT team? I'm just gonna list them quickly. You need a multidisciplinary team. It's not something you do on your own. You need stage-wise interventions. You need access to comprehensive services. You need motivational interventions. I took the liberty of putting in invitational interventions, the RISE model in there as well. You need substance abuse counseling. You need group th treatment. Your loan will be very grateful for that. Family participations, uh, participation of drug and alcohol self-help groups. Pharmacological treatment, uh, interventions to promote health, and they mean health in the broader sense here, and secondary interventions for non-responders. So that brings me, so I look for time, how good we are. Yeah, we're still fine. Brings me to personalized addiction care. So the question is, how many of you think this is new, personalized approach to addiction care? Very good, nobody. This is a nice quote by Jung that already saw that I treat every patient and as individually as possible because the solution of the problem is always an individual one. To prove even more that it's not new is the first person who spoke about individualized or personalized medicine was Hippocrates. He was talking about treatment of individuals to the four humors, blood, phlegm, bile, black and yellow bile. So 
he even hinted at personalized medicine. Claude Bernard also uh, said that he treats an individual in an individual manner. I found that a, to be quite a, a beautiful quote. Later on, a Frenchman wrote a paper on a study, case study of chemical individuality. So now we're going more towards uh, uh, precision medicine. So getting a precise measurement from blood tests. And then it starts getting interesting for psychiatry because we don't have blood tests to be that ac accurate. And in 2015, a Spanish psychiatrist coined the term precision psychiatry. And I'll go into precision psychiatry just a little bit. Um, so let's get going on that. So personalized medicine, the point is to get a targeted focus of the patient by the, all the individual characteristics. So everything I spoke about now, to put that all together and get that to, to link the right patient with the right treatment to get the best outcome at the best price, if you're really good. That's personalized medicine. Precision medicine is a little bit different. Precision medicine implies that you can take a blood test, for example, and say, this patient, that treatment. We're going towards that, we're not there yet. This paper was from November 2017. And it's actually the first comprehensive paper I could find about it. So this is new. The point of precision psychiatry is that it's an emerging approach. Um, it's new. Lexically, it implies that psychiatry is measurable. Now that's quite new. This will, this will revolutionize, I think, the whole of psychiatry. If we can find blood tests to know what's wrong with you, to know, this will change the whole game. But we're not there yet. The goals of precision uh, psychiatry is to get more accurate diagnosing through individualized assessment, to treat more specifically in, to, in order to improve outcomes and decrease costs. Now, I think we can all agree this is beautiful. We all want this. I think the last three we have already, we have a lot of individualized assessment, but it's not very accurate. It really, you need to be, this is also why we call it practitioners. You need to practice and continue to practice to get better at it but it's quite difficult. So I'm just going to skip through this a little bit. Um, the implications uh, for research of precision psychiatry is also quite severe because up to now we have models comparing group therapies to group therapies, not individuals to individuals. So science will also have to develop with the, 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 the uh, trend of precision psychiatry. So I guess just to sum up uh, precision uh, psychiatry. I think medicine has always been uh, personalized. We've always tried to do that. Psychiatry is maybe the most subjective of all the specialities, and so is addiction care, obviously. Uh, even though uh, precision psychiatry is new, uh, it will lead to even more personalized treatments. So I'm quite curious to see what will happen with precision psychiatry. It will revolutionize the field. Um, and I said it will also change things. So what will change, I think, once we have more precise things, and then I'm done with precision psychiatry, is I think the diagnosis will be more precise. We have to look at the genetics, because I think genetics will play a big role in this, and the treatment selection will maybe be more precise. So, looking at practical ideas, and this is actually what I'm most excited to share about to share with you guys is what do we have now and I took five examples of things I think are really important that we can use to personalize our treatments uh, in the settings that we are so the first one is Ubuntu does anybody know what Ubuntu is I know uh, one two people so Ubuntu is the African principle that means I am because we are so this you see a lot in southern Africa and how this was discovered, I'm from South Africa originally, so I grew up with this. I also like this, I live by this. Um, but the story behind this, how this was discovered by the Western world was, the story goes as follows, that a discoverer went to Africa and he organized a race for a bunch of children. And he said, okay, so you have a race and the winner gets a bag of sweets. And they were all very excited that they did the race and 
there was a winner and the winner got the bag of sweets. And they went and they sat down and the winner shared the sweets with everybody in the group. And the guy was like, are you crazy? What are you doing? You're the winner. The sweets are for you. And the child was like, but how can I not share with them? Because without them, there would be no race. That's the cultural lesson. I work in the Netherlands. It's different in the Netherlands. Um, <laughs> You always share with me, that's true, John. Um, so I think the first point I want to make is to don't, do not forget the cultural aspects of the patient that you are treating. Culture is a common heritage or a set of beliefs or norms, values shared by a group of people. This could be uh, the family, it could be the, 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 the culture that you live in, and this has impact on everything. Um, prevention, development of the mental illness, motivation for treatment, the type of treatment best suited, the recovery process, and even the relapse risk. So it affects everything about your treatment. There's also a lot of stigma through culture. We work in different countries, and we see that. And the stigma, for example, we work in Spain and the Netherlands, and I come from South Africa. So even between the three countries that I'm, I know really well, we see that even the stigma is different between cultures. A practice, in my opinion, should we can, or can be personalized by understanding at least the racial, ethnic, religious and cultural background of your patient. It's wonderful if you have the shared, a shared background, that's great, but usually I think where we all work, that's not the case. We all work in multicultural societies. So then at least have some understanding or try to understand just by listening of what the patients tell you. Understand the influence this has on, uh, on the addiction and the comorbidity. And if possible, even develop specific programs. I know there are programs developed in different countries for different culture groups. If possible, it's something to think about. And obviously family therapy, which is my second point. We'll get to that just now. Getting back to Mrs. X, you thought well, I was done with her, but not yet. If you look at the <laughs> cultural aspects, um, very important, she's from a Chinese background and they do not accept that ADHD or addiction Happen. So ADHD does not happen in adults and addiction not in their family. Not, not only in Chinese families this happens, but it did complicate the whole process. What happened though is that the primary trigger for her addiction was not recognized by the family or even by her in the beginning. She struggled with that. Addiction was stigmatized by the family, which kept them from therapy, so we couldn't engage in family therapy because of the stigma. And the therapy with her was influenced by shame, uh, absence of the family, and the difficulty that she had integrating into the Dutch culture. So the next one is family. What's important about family? What's important with family is to engage uh, the families in therapy and in the process. What I see often is that people get treated at treatment centers, nothing happens to the family, and a person with, who's changed completely gets put back into a family that hasn't changed at all. And then we as healthcare providers scratch behind our ears like, what is happening? <laughs> with this patient that keeps on relapsing. What do we think is happening with this patient that's relapsing? Didn't have family therapy. Personally, um, I use transitional family therapy. I'll show you a genogram just now. And that's a very nice way of getting a big overview of what's on with this family and helping the family from feeling vulnerable, feeling useless, feeling victimized, to feeling proud and accepting their addiction as part of their family. It's important to look at the genetic components, the heritage, and work on the resilience. And that's why Arise is at the top. Arise is, I'm not sure if Judith is here, I see Pam and Gail, but the people from Arise are in the room and they have a lecture tomorrow morning as well at 9 o'clock. I can recommend that. But how it works, and this is a small um, genogram, Usually in Arise we do much bigger genograms, but this is how far we could get with Mrs. X. So this is Mrs. X, 
all the red things are addiction, people with addiction. The yellow things are the mental health issues. And I just put in two transitions so you can understand what it is. So the immigration in 1980 of the family and the death of her, her grandfather. And the blue lines, oh, my blue line here looks horrible, but she had a bad relationship with the mother and a very good with the grandfather. And what's so important about this is, so her family was not there. That's why we couldn't get very far with, with the genogram. But I still did the RISE stuff with her. And we started off and she was, she almost went through a grief process in the therapy. She started off by feeling um, victimized almost and angry at the family and angry at everybody in the family. And we moved through that process and it was a grief process of feeling anger and resentment onto a point of acceptance, onto a point of understanding because we did get a little bit further than her grandparents, but at least by doing this, she could understand why her parents were treating her the way they were treating her. And that gave her at least a little bit of rest. So it's not a very good example of what you can do with, with family therapy, but just to give you an idea of uh, using a genogram um, to treat your patient. Next one, because I want to get to the discussion, to hear what you guys are thinking. Um, ethics. I'm going to just talk about one ethical point. Ethics is a big topic, of course, but I'm, don't forget the autonomy of your patient. The only time when we can break autonomy or act against the autonomy of the patient is if there's danger and the patient does not want to be treated. So if somebody is a danger to themselves and they don't want to be treated, then we can be paternalistic, take over the treatment. But for the rest, shared decision making is part of your process and you get much better outcomes if you can engage the patient into the process. I still hear about people saying that you just have to grab the, the addict, I also hate the word the addict, the person suffering from addiction, to grab the patient, throw them into treatment and change them. That doesn't work. So the third thing that you can make to personalize your, your treatment is never ever forget the autonomy of your patient. Gender specific approaches in our clinic, we have a, we have a program. But one of the ways in which we try to individualize it is we have a men's group and a women's group. Unfortunately, those are the only two groups we have because we don't have more of it. I mean, there is much more to do, I think. Um, I think be sensitive to the sexual preferences and identity of your patient. I know they have specific LGBTQ and all sorts of varieties, um, but be sensitive and discuss the specific gender topics um, with your patient. Once again, some people are embarrassed to talk about this. I think if you are a care provi provider, you shouldn't be embarrassed. The last one is e-health. And I'm not going to go into the specifics of e-health. There are many people around that know much more about e-health than I do. But e-health is up and coming. It is uh, an emerging approach and you can really use it to track your patient. There are resiliency apps, there are wearables, there are ways in, I was presenting in Stockholm uh, this year and we learned there that people are using apps to do breathalyzer tests um, and connect with their therapists. Uh, you can use, uh, not Skype calls by the way, but uh, video conferencing. Uh, there's many ways in which we can use e-health and it really is a field that if you can implement even a few things to individualize the treatment, especially with young people, this is really valuable. So what happened to Mrs. X? Well, she completed six weeks program in our clinic, then went home, had a year after care. Um, she was treated for ADHD and addiction. All of the borderline stuff that she diagnosed in herself was never there. Uh, she actually completed her university studies now. She was busy with her thesis when I made this, but she's, she's finishing now. She had no panic attacks, no anxiety disorder, didn't need any medication or treatment for that. It all stopped when she got sober and got treated for the ADHD. And the best thing is that she found hope in the connection that she found in the self-help group. She even goes to uh, self-help groups for people with ADHD. We also have an ADHD group in the clinic and patients kind of support each other in that as well. So this slide I stole from John Kelly from Harvard. 
I should still tell him that I did this, but he will probably see this. Because I think this is such a great slide. I think the goal of what we do in addiction treatment is recovery, and we should never forget that. We should never treat to serve our own egos, to show what we can do. It's about the patient and the patient's recovery. So this slide just shows you what a regular patient uh, in America, how, uh, how their recovery pathway would look like. And you can see that it takes about four to five years from onset of addiction to seek for help. Then in about eight years, patients will have four to five treatment episodes, so relapses, before they come, be, uh, become sustained in remission. Then you need about five years of continuation of care, which almost nobody gets, but with self-help organizations you can get there. And then you get to a point where you have a relapse risk of 15%, so stable remission. This is a long way to go. And imagine you have addiction. Some people in the room have addiction. This is very tough. And we have to individualize our treatments to serve the patients the best we can where they are on this road to recovery. So there was a great study done, a meta-analysis, where they looked at people with dual diagnosis and they asked the patient, which is quite clever to ask the patients what they think and what helped them with recovery. And I really like this study and they pointed out four things. The first one was being connected. I think in most talks you hear uh, at this Congress as well, it's about the connection. It's also about the family, the connection of the family, but also with the self-help groups, connecting. The second most important thing helping people to get into recovery and stay in recovery is individualized treatment, what we're talking about here today, and shared decision making. The third thing I summed up as spirituality, but they literally said having personal beliefs such as fostering feelings of hope, building a sense of new identity, gaining ownership of your life, and finding support in spirituality. So the aspect of hope and spirituality. And the last thing was meaningfulness, I call it. We, our slogan is even meaningful life. That's how much we believe in this. But the importance of meaningful activities to structure your life and motivate you to carry on. So it also has the essence of hope in it. So my last slide I call next Tuesday because we're all going to the Congress. But what can you do as for, of next Tuesday? when you're back in the office. I want to challenge you all to review your own caseload. Use the stuff, if you have learned anything new today, use those things. Consider your own initial assessment of patients. Many of us have been assessing patients for many years and we never think, uh, is there maybe a different way in which we can look at our patients? But challenge yourself and see if you can find another way of looking at your patients. And the last point I want to make today, and I think this is maybe the most important thing, is be sure to see the whole patient, install hope for your, your patients, listen, be kind, show compassion, and build trusts. And if you can accomplish that with your patient, then you're a lucky person, and people are lucky to have you in their lives. I'm going to leave you with that, and if there are any questions or comments, I have a dry throat, so... You can talk. My fan base again. Does anybody have any questions or things they want to say or share? We need to use microphones, so somebody's going around. No, I'm Aisha. part of your fan base. I just wanted to say that. Oh, Aisha was just waving at me. <laughs> anybody else? Everybody? Hi, thank you so much. Hello. That was very interesting and helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not quite sure how to put this question, but um, having trained uh, in the Minnesota model 30 years ago um, and watching the whole field merge the uh, originally very separate um, addiction in one camp psychiatric problems miles away in another camp and gradually the various clinics starting to merge. Yeah. How, do, how does your team um, 
present to the patients, the clients, this change in approach, particularly with, um, in the view of some of the old-fashioned wording, for instance, you know, 12-step meetings. Um, how do you sort of tackle that and, and explain what might look like discrepancies in, in yeah. the sort of two approaches? Yeah. Thank you very much for that question. I think that's a very important question. Michel is sitting here smiling. He's our founder. And he started 15 years ago merging the, what you said, said the self-help groups with the regular care, which we call it in the Netherlands. And I think it's a daily struggle. It's a daily, well, struggle is maybe a strong word for it, but we work at it daily. Um, because like in our team, I think about 40% of people 40 to 45 percent of people are in recovery themselves and there are some really really firm believers that the only way to recover is the step 12 steps mm -hmm. and then we have everything in the spectrum on, on, on people uh, uh, treating, treating there um, to people who don't, do not believe in 12 steps at all so um, we have what we do is we have our own model the, the trial run model which I guess is has a lot of influence from the Minnesota. It's a 12-step facilitation model, so we take bits and pieces of everything, then we have the model, and in, within the model we try to personalize it. So we have personalized group, we have personalized sessions. Um, how we teach the team that is through intervision. We have two weekly, weekly intervision with the team in which we discuss the differences. And the most important thing is that people come with their strengths from their own backgrounds and the way they treat um, and not the weaknesses. So we try to uh, stimulate everybody to bring to the table what they have to help the patient the best. And we try to keep the patient central because that's the reason why everybody is there. If you lose sight of that, then it becomes a battle of who is right. And it's not about who is right, it's about what is best for the patient. So that's kind of, do you have anything to add? Is that kind of what you, that's, if that answers your question, that's, that's, but it's a tough process. Correct. It's a tough process. It's a and it's about, day by day. yeah, so if that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Welcome. In the back, there's a gentleman. The, the mic, sorry, we actually need to use, if you want yeah, to use uh, this Hi. mic. Um, do you think there's a problem with language here when you use the phrase dual diagnosis? It immediately implies that addiction is not a mental illness and that sort of perpetuates the stigma in some way. Do you think there's a problem with language? I think there's a problem in language in addiction care in general. I think it starts by the way we talk about people suffering from addiction. We call them addicts. You know, I think it's even in that very basic way in which we communicate there's a problem in language uh, of psychiatry and I think dual diagnosis it's, it's you know I've been struggling quite long with finding a good solution to the definition of dual diagnosis but I agree with you it it kind of implies that mental illness is something different from addiction it implies the moral choice doesn't it of addiction yes exactly so there is like a small window there to to stigma I guess so, yeah, I mean, if anybody has any brilliant idea, I'm still struggling to find it. But I think we need to, I think, that, you know, this, um, I showed that slide that I said I stole from uh, John Kelly. But if you look on his website, addiction, addiction answers, no, recoveryanswers.com, he's got a thing called the Addictionary, which I love. And the Addictionary shows you all those words like addict, and there's, there's like in big red stigma alert next to it. <laughs> And then he explains what is meant with it, and then he says, well, person living with addiction is maybe a more apt term to use for that, and not the addict. So, but I think, I think in general we have to work on the way we talk about addiction and people suffering or living with addiction. Thank you for that. That's uh, thank you. Very good question. Uh, Dr. Maton, you seemed a little bit skeptical of disease model theory uh, in your presentation which implies, dismal theory implies that certain people have an intrinsic neurobiological vulnerability to addictive disorder and seem to suggest that uh, addictive behavior is more a function of circumstance, uh, psychosocial circumstance, tragic or, or indulged. Mm -hmm. So my question is, um, 
would you have a problem with recommending or endorsing a controlled using once a person's psychosocial circumstances through the treatment process have been addressed? Mm. Okay, just to clarify, I'm, I'm not against the disease model. I think everybody can agree that uh, the, the brain, dis brain disease model is what we call it in the Netherlands on addiction. So I'm not against that at all. I just think it's more than that. I think we should grow past that and add to it maybe. Um, and the second part of your question was on... The more important part of the question is that if somebody's psychosocial circumstances c can be addressed and oh, uh, yes. corrected, yes. in the light of that, would you have an objection to people returning to what is argued as presented as controlled drinking yeah. um, or resumption of, of use if yeah, the, yeah, yeah. those factors that precipitated yeah, yeah, yeah. addictive behaviour have been removed? You know, that's difficult. Um, we run a treatment center which we advise total abstinence so we say if you have addiction it's biological with all, everything around that and you shouldn't so that's what we advise i also know of examples uh, in my own life of people that have stopped for a certain number of years and started to use alcohol for example again stopped hard drugs but used alcohol mm. and they're fine they're functioning so i'm kind of thinking who am i to judge on that I think the jury is out. We advise total abstinence. I think total abstinence is to be advised, at least for the first few years, um, because the risk of relapse is so high in the first few years of abstinence. And I think it's a very personal matter. I think this, I don't know if, if it's quite a hot topic. I don't think if I should open the, the discussion on that. <laughs> but uh, personally, I think that's a very personal uh, question. Yeah, just a comment, if you were to, uh, as a physician, if you were to advocate someone returns to control drinking, it would be a case possibly for negligence or not negligence. It could be, it could be, yeah. yeah. I, I'm just trying to understand, um, just for my own comprehension, um, so th there seems to be a little bit of tension between the idea of an integrated treatment program mm -hmm. and then treating the crocodile closest to the boat. So if someone was presenting with like severe psychosis but also with, you know, other another, you know, maybe not substance use but an eating disorder or something like that, how would you, you know, what would you treat that? I mean, w together? Yeah. So in our treatment facility we don't you know, we have a, we have a very structured therapeutic uh, process so schizophrenia is quite severe you know then people with schizophrenia can't uh, engage in group therapy process so we don't treat schizophrenia but in theory um, if somebody presents with an acute psychosis and that um, leads to a dangerous situation then you have to treat that first before you start working on the addiction you have to treat uh, I guess the crocodile closest to the boat is the one that also gives the most uh, dangerous uh, situations for the patient or the, the environment. It's not only the one that's most bothersome to the patient or to uh, the environment, um, but also the one with the most danger potential for the patient. But would you involve the whole team from the outset and do it all in the one yeah. location? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, try just, that. just trying to understand. Yeah, no, no, Thank you. Question. Thank you. Just looking at uh, a little bit more time. Any more pressing questions, things people want to share? I think. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming out today. It's a beautiful summer day, so go enjoy. Thank you for coming. Yeah.